Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, wherever you are in the world, and welcome to episode 2 from the Grandstands. Today, we will be covering off all of the silly season shenanigans in supercars around the biggest false start since Bryce Fullwood's big one at Sydney Motorsport Park. Of course, we're talking about Team Sydney and everything that's gone on there. Also on the agenda today, we'll wrap up both the men's and women's Ashes. Uh, party with Ash Barty at the tennis in the Australian Open. And we'll talk about our favourite parts of the upcoming Winter Olympics and the things that we're going to be watching uh, over the next two weeks. All coming to you today from the grandstands. And joining me, as always, is the one and only Kiwi Chris. Good evening, Chris. Good evening, Michael. It's really, really good view from the top of this grandstand. Got a oh, packed show tonight. Let's get right into it. Almost as good as the view from the top of Daytona. <laughs> yes, it was. Okay. Oh, what, a, what a race that was. That was pretty dope. And we'll talk about that on Endurance Chat proper. But let's talk about some supercars discussions first, Chris. And boy, howdy, it has been, of course, just the weirdest, most uh, absurd part of the silly season uh, this January little break. Team Sydney is now no longer Team Sydney. In fact, it was never actually based in Sydney, so it wasn't ever really Team Sydney. It is now Team Premier. God, catch us up, Kiwi. What the hell has gone on? So Team Sydney uh, no longer. Uh, Team Premier, they're owned by Peter Zaberis, who's a name you wouldn't know. He's he's Mr. Premier, but he's also a top fuel drag runner. Oh. And is a champion at that. Cool, okay. So, like, so, if it, so if anyone's got money to burn in motorsport, you think a drag racer would. Yeah, so there, there's a bit of a story behind this as well. Uh, of course, there, it was reported in November, question mark, that Team mm-hmm. Sydney was absolutely up for sale and it was something that uh, the team was looking at getting rid of and being sold. And then not two days later, uh, Team Sydney released a thing saying, Team Sydney is absolutely not on the sale. We are committed to this project. We are committed to making this Team Sydney work. And then it was, what, mid-January? When, it, when was it that they, uh, it was 19 days ago, it was January 13th, uh, that uh, John O'Webb said, Team Sydney has been sold. Peace out. Uh, without... Hey, we- by the well, way, yeah, yeah, peace out without telling his drivers. Yeah, that's that's always a great uh, a great start, isn't it? When your drivers find out that they no longer have a drive via social media, <laughs> far out. That's exactly how you manage a team. It's fine. For, it was fine for um, Gary Jacobson because he was sponsored by Peter Zuberis. Yeah, but not so much for Fabian Coulthard, who is now a free agent uh, and is looking very intently at getting a co drive. Which, there's a few spots open at decent teams. I think Tickford is still looking for a couple. Uh, well, well, where do you reckon uh, Fabs ends up then? Because, uh, of course, there's a slot open at WAU as well. There is. Um, I don't think WAU would necessarily go for him. But I could see a team like he, like a Tickford, Brad Jones maybe, picking him up. Because he, certainly, if you have a young main game driver, he would not be the worst pick. Exactly, that sort of balance of experience to go with the exuberance of youth would be really, really good in that sort of situation. Absolutely. Uh, Erebus, maybe as well. That would be a good shout. Although they've really, like with with Perkins and Russell there, that's actually like a pretty fun sort of, they all have the same sort of vibe. So I'm not sure True. if if Fabs passes that vibe check. Do, no, you reckon, do, you reckon, do you reckon Fabs is a larrikin? Do you reckon he gets on with Brown? Uh... I mean, he could be a demon on the drink. We don't know. <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> it's been a pretty, it's been a pretty like sharp fall from grace for Fabian, hasn't it? Because it was only what two years ago that he was with the DJR Team Penske team and in the hunt for championships. Yeah, and causing fake debris cautions and all that sort of fun. Oh my gosh, yeah. And then, I'm not. I'm, not, I'm gonna bring that up every episode if I can. Oh please, please, please do because that's disgusting. But please also don't. <laughs> But um, yeah, it's a massive fall from grace for a driver who wasn't, well, while not necessarily the best on the grid, deserved better than what he's got now. Yeah, that's true. It was kind of uh, a step up from a journeyman, you'd say. Like, I never really thought yeah. that Fabs had the, the ability to win a championship, but he was certainly serviceable, certainly more serviceable than some of the other sort of pay drivers that we've seen, or even some of the other journeymen we've seen in the supercars over the last few years. Absolutely. That'd be very actually I just had a look at the co drivers. There's only two spots that have actually officially been named. But you can do the math around, you know, he's not gonna go he's not gonna find himself at uh Triple A, he's not gonna find himself at Premier Racing, I wouldn't have thought. Oh no, probably not. <laughs> 
Um, so yeah, Tickford, even Grove Racing might look at him as well with Lee Hollingsworth potentially. That, actually, that wouldn't be too bad a shout uh, for for mm. Fabs. Uh, yeah. What What about Team Sydney and the Team Sydney project, uh, Chris? How 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 would you rate Team Sydney on a on a scale of one to ten? Negative sixty four point two. And you wouldn't be a point off. No, I mean it was just a, okay. COVID didn't help, but it was an ambitious project with a team owner who has really gone off the rails in the last few years with cars that were no good, based out of Sydney Motorsport Park, which was ambitious considering that no other team is based in Sydney apart from Brad no Jones. One. No one, not no Brad Jones, based in Albury. Yeah, well, I mean Albury is Albury in Victoria or New South Wales. It's in New South Wales, just. Just. Okay, well, that doesn't really count. Oh. But it, but you just don't have the supply chains. You don't have the workforce. You don't have anything like that. Oh, you don't have the facilities either. So I, hmm. I've actually gone back, and let's 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 chronicle this this sort of malarkey. So the whole reason that Team Sydney happened is because Supercars moved their operating base into Sydney and was like, there are no supercars fans in Sydney. There's nothing supercars related in Sydney. We need a team here. And part of that is the fact that, you know, no one had made it. No one had put a team in Sydney for 15 years. 15 yeah. years. Like, can you even remember what the last team based out of Sydney was? Because that would have been 2007. In Not in the recent era. Uh, uh, it would have been, a, would have been a privateer team, but. Exactly. Uh, and I think there was a little bit of government money behind this as well to try and get them to relocate. Well, it was part of, like part of the facilities upgrade was actually mm. for SMP, so it was thirty three million dollars rolled into SMP. Part of it was government funded, but that was going to be the new Team Sydney home base. Now that part of it never got finished. In fact, Techno Autosports never actually moved out of their Gold Coast base into that facility. So that was uh, a false start from the beginning. Then, of course, you have the entire drama with not getting sponsors, with bringing Courtney on board, Courtney bringing his own sponsors, and then Courtney leaving straight away because of a... Uh, a I've, got the, I've got the quote here from, uh, from the Supercar... Oh, sorry, the Speed Cafe article uh, saying that we, we have not been able to, to agree on a way forward uh, and apparently that's because there was a big commitment that was never uh, never honoured. And how many figures do you reckon that big commitment was, Kiwi? Uh, probably 600 grand. 600 grand? Yeah, we wouldn't be far off. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, driver like James Coyne, he saw the writing on the wall and just, he didn't want any part of it. And who can blame him? Uh, um, as, as it turned out, the team from there was just a basket case with equipment that was out of date and not refreshed. Like, the first thing Peter Zaveris has done is taken the cars back to Triple H said, here, refresh these, please. Yeah, not just refresh them. Any team should be doing that. (laughs) Yeah, not just refresh them, but make them up to spec. Make them up to the same spec that you guys are racing. Yeah. Um, So, just a bit of a train wreck. And then, you know, this whole project has ended up stillborn and Supercars still doesn't have a team in Sydney (laughs) after all that. (laughs) Yes, because these guys are moving back to Brisbane, which is where Premier the racing the drag team is based. Yeah, so a fun a fun times in Team Sydney. Mm. Uh, just mm. just to round off, uh, who are the drivers that are in Team Sydney now? Uh, so you still you got oh, Premier Racing as it's now known. You got oh, Jerry, sorry. yeah, you got Gary Jacobson still. Yep, and Coke Money courtesy of Chris Pither. So Chris Pither comes full circle. <laughs> yes, he basically comes full circle, comes back. Oh joy. Yeah. Uh brilliant. Uh, I, I like. I, I. It was always a thing from the very beginning that this looked like. It, it never really looked like a, sol- a solidified team, and I'll always remember. I can't find the the exact quote, but I remember seeing something from Betty Clemenko when Team Sydney was first got announced, basically saying, "I got asked. I did the sums. It wasn't going to work. So I don't know how they're doing it." Yeah. And if Betty and if Betty can't make it work with all her. Financial player. That was team. That was techno. Exactly. I'm not sure about you, but I got the impression that uh, Webb was disinterested after after 2016, after winning the Bathurst 12 Hour, and after winning the Bathurst 1000. He the team never seemed the same. It, it wasn't, um, and I think that coincided with a lot of financial issues with the techno. I guess the techno his performance division because I remember looking through the financials of that and going. 
this is not this is not sustainable. Okay. Um, so I think there was an element of that too. He just kept fighting and fighting to make it to keep it all afloat, but he really couldn't give a rat's about the supercars team by the end of it, and it showed. Yeah, well, exactly. It, it showed. Look, so look at, look, at, look at who he lost from the team after 2016. You know, you had some massive names in terms of engineers like Steve Hallam and Campbell Little. Campbell, Campbell Little, Little as well was involved with that team. Yep, and you know, drivers such like Shane Van Gisbergen, and yeah, and Will Davison as well. <clears throat> And they, and that was pretty much the start of the end. Uh, yeah, exactly. That was that was where things started to go wrong. And, and I wonder mm. how much taking on Jack LeBrock was part of like, uh, here is Triple Eight or Tickford money. Give Jack a seat, and we'll pay you for it. Yeah, that's fair. I yeah. think that's exactly what it was. Yeah. Anyway, that's that's the the ballad of Team Sydney. That's all done now. Uh, Chris, what what else have we learned from supercars? over the last few weeks. There's been one or two little announcements. Yeah. Uh, actually, a couple of announcements today. Uh, Darwin's going to be a full-on Indigenous round, including that, mandatory liveries. That's pretty cool. Uh, that, it's been cool to see uh, the supercars and Australian sport in general actually celebrate Indigenous mm. culture a lot more. We saw it a lot with the Big Bash this year, which will come across later, I'm sure. And also, uh, uh, AFL does an Indigenous round, which when uh, COVID restrictions... like. Sorry for saying this, but when COVID restrictions had uh, Melbourne on lockdown, having the uh, the First Nations round in or the Dreaming round in Darwin was absolutely amazing. If it wasn't for the fact that it set out the MCG, I'd say keep doing that. Hell yeah! Even even for the Welcome to Country, which was the best damn thing I've ever seen on TV last year. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, and so, for for those who don't who aren't in Australia, uh, the welcome to the country is like a specifically specific ceremony or a specific welcome from the indigenous community to the wider community for this event. So, uh, the the point that both Chris and I are referencing is when they had the Dreamtime round, which is the indigenous Australians religio cultural uh, sort of the dream. That's what the dreaming is. It's their religio cultural views. When we had that round in. Uh, 2020 up in Darwin, which has the largest indigenous population relative, uh, like per capita of any of the capital cities, the welcome to country from that community was just like so far and away the best thing about that entire round and having all the uh, like indigenous people there as well made it just such a cool atmosphere. Um, And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's been something that has been started to get a lot more traction within Australian sporting communities and actually, furthermore, Australian communities as well, which has been really, really good. Yeah. So that's going to be been an incredible weekend of racing, I think, up at uh, Darwin. Uh, also, they've announced the race formats and tyres for this year as well. Ooh, any any interesting things about that so far? Any uh, surprises? Yeah, I'm su- I was surprised because super soft tires, they're they're back, they're blue, and they're even softer. Even softer, really? They're, they're making them even softer. My gosh, uh, are we gonna turn it to F one with the tires? <laughs> <laughs> but now we've got hard soft and super softs. Uh the super softs we'll see at that Darwin round, as yep. well as Winton, Townsville. And Sydney and Tasmania as well. Oh, super softs at Townsville is going to be an absolute bloodbath. Think about the marbles off the side of the road as you're going across Boundary Street. Yeah. <laughs> it's 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 a hard and super soft allocation. So, oh yuck! <laughs> imagine imagine going from a set of super softs doing like a, a 10, 15 lap stint on a set of super softs, absolutely ruining mm. them, and then going onto a set of cards for the rest of the race. That would be yeah. like driving a boat. <laughs> <laughs> same thing at Sydney Motorsport Park as well with the 300k races at, at least SMP has runoff like <laughs> I, I, like a bold prediction right out the gate I predict that someone's going to get onto a hard tyre and put it in the wall at Townsville just because they're not used to that grip level easily easily <laughs> easily uh, the other things of note that came out uh, with the formats Mount Panorama obviously the 1000k Enduro we're starting the season with a couple of 300k races, not at Newcastle because of COVID. Newcastle is being postponed. Yeah, which is another shame. So guess what? We're doing another mm. round in Sydney. <laughs> Sydney Motorsport Park, woo! At least their endurance races, which I think suit SMP a lot better. Yeah, I think so too. So that's silver lining on that uh, Sydney Motorsport Park charade. Yeah. 
otherwise, and they, oh, according to this report, I'm reading they're saying Marvels aren't a massive concern for these super soft tires. We'll wait, to see. we'll wait to see on that one. Yeah, we'll wait and see. <laughs> Um, good to see that uh, we've already talked about a supercars going back to Albert Park, supporting the F1, mm-hmm. so that that's good. Um, yeah, absolutely. And a few more endurance events. Um, I see that uh, the Gold Coast this year, should it go ahead, of course, like, you know, we've been talking about these things as if they're confirmed, um, but uh, Gold Coast is actually going to be an enduro around again. Enduro-ish, 250. Yeah, so there'll yeah. be one driver, uh, but yeah, two 250k races, at, at similar to what we had at... Adelaide. Oh, yeah. I miss Adelaide so much. I mean, I'm, uh, in, I'm in Adelaide, but you get the idea. Yeah, so, so, got two, so we're going to have two 50k races at Townsville and at Newey as well. Bathurst, obviously, is 1,000 k's. It'd be right if you change that. Everything else, 100, 100 to 125 k. And I see we're going back to Pukekohe as well for three, uh, three 115k races. As long as New Zealand open their borders, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that's that's the supercars sort of formats for the year. So uh, unsurprising there in terms of the uh, the like the super sprints, which is generally what we're going to see. A, a few races at night as well. So the opening race is going to be at dusk, and then night racing in Perth. What are your thoughts on night racing in Perth, Chris? I love it, but okay, you got the time zones issue with the Eastern Seaboard, but. That's- like, it works really well at Perth. It, it really does. Yeah, it does. Like that's the thing. It works super well. But the thing is, a like a race starting at seven p.m. in Perth starts at eight thirty at in in Melbourne or Sydney. So like that that time difference, and that's assuming it's in the middle of winter. If there's daylight savings involved, then it's starting at nine thirty p.m. on the eastern seaboard. So that's like it's it's. it's It'll be winter. It'll be, I think it's June, July. So it'll be a two-hour time difference from Perth to here in Melbourne. Yeah. Um, but it works well, for example, the day-night tests in the cricket. I See, I don't agree. I really don't agree. I mean, as much as I love watching cricket all the way until I have to go to bed, I think that you should be doing the night things on the Eastern seaboard. So that way the Western guys don't have to get up super early as opposed to doing the night things on the Western seaboard. So that way everyone else has to stay up late. It, it kind of doesn't make logical yeah, sense to me. The only place on the Eastern seaboard you can do night racing. It's Sydney, is in Sydney or QR and no one wants to go to QR for it yet. Yeah. Maybe, maybe in the future when Tony Quinn fixes the place up. We can only hope. <laughs> but at the moment, you want to have a short track so your temporary lighting's not exorbitantly expensive. So that leaves Perth and Tassie. And Tassie in winter? No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Uh, so that's supercars. That's the supercars action. First race for the supercars is the very beginning of next month. It's March 4th to 6th, so we'll probably spend a lot of our time next month uh, with from uh, episode three of From the Grandstand talking about uh, what's going to happen in terms of supercars. So that's come across us very quickly, hasn't it, Chris? It's almost as quick as my, freak, my, fa- my fiance's pregnancy. And that's also come up very quickly. <laughs> yes. Uh, luckily, we've got one more episode with you yet before the baby's due. So that's good for now. Yeah, Fingers for now. crossed. What, el- what else has been going on, Chris? What else have we been watching? Well, I know you and I have been thoroughly engrossed by the cricket the last month. Yes, and we we lied. We lied to our loyal listeners, Chris. You know what we said? Mm -hmm. We said that nothing would stop Australia from winning 5-0. You know what happened? Rain. Sydney's weather happened. (laughs) Yep. And to be fair, a little glimmer of England suddenly remembering how to play cricket. Just a a glimpse. Uh, uh, And like... In the end, that was all that they needed. But really, the, we were, uh, Australia won the Ashes four point nine to nil. Uh, <laughs> yes, it was a, a last wicket partnership to win a to win a draw. I, like that sounds dumb. If you're not a quick cricket fan, that is absolutely the right uh, terminology to be using. Basically, what happened is that Australia didn't get England all out before the the game ran out of time. So they actually held on to win a draw. So cricket's weird, okay? Just roll with us on this. Um, but Chris, when your high point of the series is surviving a draw, a rain-affected draw 
by one wicket. Man, that's that's a, a a pretty dim light in a very dim series for England. Yes. Compound that with the fact that the English had what three injuries coming from that fourth test as well. Yeah, well, it was Besto and uh, Butler, who were their wicketkeeper and their backup wicketkeeper, both with mm. hand injuries. So I think yep. Besto had a broken tarsal on his left hand. Left hand? Mm-hmm. Um, yep. And uh, no, Butler had a to- broken tarsal. Besto had the like thumb good... break. Yeah, but. Butler cost a brute of a copped a brute of a delivery. Yeah, so it actually like hit him on the mm. hand because it bounced right in front of him, which was not great. Um, yeah, and then the other. Do you remember what the other injury from that? Yeah, uh, well, you had Ben Stokes who had a side strain, meaning meaning he couldn't bowl. Mm. But there was someone else. I'm sure of it. Uh, anyway, yeah, it's. Like, there were so many things that went wrong for the English campaign, it's hard yeah. to remember which was which. They had a backup keeper in the Big Bash who had to drive from Brisbane to Sydney without stopping. Yeah, to be able to get into the team hotel to isolate, so that way when they went to Hobart, that he would yeah. uh, clear to play. And I remember I remember on uh, ABC Radio, which for, is actually called Grandstand Radio, by the way. <laughs> so, we're not, <laughs> we're not stealing their name, this is just a happy coincidence. Um... <laughs> They were getting text updates from, I think it was Sam Billings, on his way yeah. down. Because, of course, he's never driven in Australia like that before. So he's driving, uh, <laughs> how long's the distance from Brisbane to Sydney? It's a, It was about uh, eight, eight hours or something like that? Eight hours. And, of course, his great mate Steve Finn was on commentary, so he had the Snapchat tracking him as he went as well. Uh, yeah, that was brilliant. Uh, the sort of the sort of comedy the English team has been known for, and as yeah. well to to go to go to Hobart and again lose within three days, uh, showing a pretty well hapless performance. Truth be told, in that second innings, I mean, I know the conditions in Hobart were very much attuned to bowling, um, but they kind of just fell apart like a deflating yeah. pancake. Yeah, and that was the one test where the openers were actually competent. And the rest of the side forgot how to play. Yeah, I mean, what was what was the? Did they get to a, a hundred opening partnership? I think they got close, if not to it. And then the rest of it just went. You know what? You haven't supported us all tour. We're not going to do it now. Oh uh, boy, yeah, that was we, not not great. Yeah, I was going to ask you as well. Day night test in Tassie. Is it a bit much? To be honest, I didn't actually catch a lot of the test in Tassie explicitly because I was actually on holiday with some friends of mine um, and we were we basically just had the test on in the background um, and I was actually really excited on the last day of our holiday to go home and watch some cricket, you know, just sort of chill out, do all my washing, hang around, have a really slow day watching the cricket. But by, of course, by then England had already lost. Yeah. Um, it, honestly, I... I- I think it's a, it's pretty bowler friendly down there anyway. So when you get the pink ball moving at night, I think it swings a bit too far to the bowling side of things. Yeah, possibly. And we have seen. I don't think we've seen a pink test. Well, I mean, I don't see. I don't think we've seen a pink test go into the fifth day yet. Adelaide, this test or this test series went to the fifth day. So what the hell am I saying? Um, they seem to be very much more bowling weighted. Uh, con- conditions. So maybe maybe it's something uh, that they need to do another another iteration of the pink ball to maybe find something that maybe it's because it, it's kind of like a soft tire. It goes really really hard to begin with, and you've got you know ten fifteen overs where it swings, it dips, it nips around off the pitch, and it's really really hard to bat. But then it goes soft super quickly, and then it's kind of dead for the rest of the 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 innings. So yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I mean, wa- I wonder if that that's a part of it, or if it's part of the pitch as well, or if it's just the the conditions cooling during the day that makes it uh, more bowler friendly. I'm not sure. A good combination, and plus there was a lot of grass on the pitch too. Mm. It was very green. Um, to be fair, Tassie did the best they could with the amount of notice they had. That's true as well. Of course, for those out of the loop, uh, it was actually one of the tests was actually meant to be planned for Perth. Um, so it was actually meant to be the day-night test match in Perth, but of course, uh, West Australia's border conditions meant that, uh, no one could actually get in. So they rescheduled it, I think on the eve of the first test match or somewhere in the first test match. So basically a month out from when the event was meant to start. And because cricket again is a really, really weird game, it takes about a month to actually properly prepare a cricket pitch for five days of cricket. So they didn't do too badly, truth be told. No, they did perfectly fine. And in the end... The right result from Australian point of view, 
as you said, 4.9 to nil. And, Ash is staying in Australia. Well, I, I, and it's kind of gotten to the point now where the Ashes series in Australia are probably the least interesting series to watch because the last the last good Ashes series in Australia was really, and I, I say good as in competitive, was really 2010-2011, which was probably one of the lowest points in Australia's uh, test cricket stocks basically the one of the you know leanest periods of cricket for australia versus the all-stars of english cricket in the last 50 years so yeah yeah well mind you that statement is only true if you only follow the men's cricket that is yeah fair enough and, <laughs> and, we should and, segue to that and by the way if you weren't aware the women's cricket the women's ashes are currently also going on in australia at the moment um the Women's Ashes is a multi-format uh, competition. And so by that, it means it's actually like a, a point scoring system. So they have three T20 internationals, which is 20 overs each side, uh, one test match and three one day games, which is 50 overs each side. So the, the scoring is for each T20 or one day win, it's two points. And the test match is worth four points if you win to each side for a draw. Uh, where do you want to start with the Women's Ashes, Chris? I want to start with the T20s because you went to Adelaide to the, t- to the game in it, one of the games in Adelaide, which was a non-event, yep. unfortunately. Yeah, that was sad. <laughs> that was I, sad. But I really wanted to watch some cricket. Yeah. I did see a tweet there that you were not happy you could not buy any merchandise. Yeah, right? What the... Okay, okay, okay. So this, this, this annoyed the crap out of me. Mm. Why? Why? Cricket Australia, Big Bash women's cricket people around the world why can't i buy merchandise when i am at women's cricket game i i I, like i know that people there's less interest i know there's going to be less people there but i went to four women's cricket games this this season and none of them none of them had a single merch stand i just want to i just want to support the team like is is that so hard which is absurd it wasn't even there for the test exactly really and and there were i think it was the one of the English women's commentators on um, during the test was talking about how during the hundred you had all these kids buying the shirts of people like Heather Knight or of you know the your female English cricketers and actually wearing them proudly, just as you would go to buy a shirt from um, Kevin Peterson or whatever. Yeah. So there is a market there for that sort of stuff. You know, if you want to have Elise Perry's number on your back, number. Nine, number, I think seven, it was. Number, seven. number seven. Number seven. I mean, or if you want to, I'd, have, you want to I'd, have, I'd have at least Perry's number in my phone if I could. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> or, or if you want to get a Heather Knight shirt and after her performance in this game, why wouldn't you? I mean, like, leg- <laughs> legitimately, after we watched Amanda Wel- Amanda Jade Wellington's five for eight in the mm. the Challenger final, my mate was like, I want it. I want an Amanda Jade Wellington shirt. Like, yeah. that was awesome. Oh, I was just like, we couldn't, like, we couldn't even get a hat or anything. It was kind of. Like, I, I get that there's less of a business case there, but, like, even one stand, even one, like, 50% mm. outfitted stand with just, like, two people and, like, that would just... It would hats, raise hats, the profile so much. Yeah. Hats and shirts. That's all you need. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Anyway, so let's got, talk about the cricket. Yeah. So, we got one T20 done, which Australia won fairly comfortably, if I recall correctly. And actually, very bravely uh, selected as well. Mm. So, so let's. I, I've got the scorecard uh, of this one uh, here. So it was um, 169 for four. So if you if you're on the northern side of the world, that's how you say your cricket scores. Or if you're not in Australia, really. So 169 runs for four wickets. So the English women actually batted quite well. Uh, Danny White and Nat Siver put on a really, really good partnership, which were broke was ended up broken by um, the South Australian Talia McGrath, who who got who just bowled absolutely beautifully and just yorked. Uh, I think yorked uh, Nat Siver, and it was just incredible. Um, like completely just destroyed her stumps. It was they were everywhere. It was fantastic. Beautiful. <laughs> then uh coming into bat, uh it was uh Meg Lanning and Alyssa Healy. Alyssa Healy didn't quite get the start. She's not really been in form and Alyssa Healy, for those unaware, is one of the best female cricketers in the world. Actually married to Mitch Stark for those who are unaware, which I don't think anyone is at this point. Um but they actually sent in Talia McGrath to bat at three 
Uh, and they left Elise Perry out of the side. Now, Elise Perry, for those who only follow men's cricket, has better bowling stats and better batting stats than most specialist batsmen and bowlers, let alone all-rounders. She is and easily more... the best all-rounder yeah. in cricket. And also more more goals scored than any play on the men's team as well. <laughs> yeah, that's another thing as well. Uh, so, so to leave her out of a T20 side, put in Talia McGrath, who basically fills the same role. She's a aggressive batter and she bowls medium pace who then goes on to score 91 off of 49 balls and chase the entire target down basically by herself. What an absolute yeah. masterstroke and huge for, for McGrath. And she just sort of straight away cemented her spot in that team. Yeah. And she stayed in there for the test. They brought at least Perry back. And this test match, it, I don't know how to sum it up because it was one of the best test matches of the summer, but also one of the most frustrating how good's the cricket, Chris? <laughs> so, so like we're laughing here, but it was it was quite a balanced game. So uh, Australia got out to three thirty seven, which is a pretty good total. Uh, and then England they they were looking really in trouble for a little while. Uh, at uh, what what did they get to? They were at um, they were three for seventy odd, I believe. Well, they were five for one eighteen. So chasing mm-hmm. uh, like following on from three thirty seven, being five down for one hundred and eighteen is really not all that good. And then Heather Knight, the England captain, just turned the game on its head by being patient, by being a really, really good patient batter, and scored 168 uh, not out. She ended up this end of the innings not out, and managed to drag England to 297. So a, a lead of 40 for the Australians in the second innings, and then Chris, from there, it all just it all just turned on its head. Yeah. Uh, so second Australian innings, uh, Alyssa Healy. Healy- Obviously, continuing. So, did she get a get up with a pair? Didn't she? She ended up with a pair. Yep. So a pair, a, a pair for those who aren't in the mix is two scores of zero in the same game. Yep. Uh, and the and the Aussies ended up in a fair bit of strife and ended up having to declare with the lead. Well, hey, we'll, we'll go back a step. They ended up in strife, three down, and then the rain came, washing out the rest of day three. And the game was really delicately poised. In Australia at this point had a lead of not one, much, not much, seventy odd. The problem was this is a four day test match, so you have a hundred overs left to try and manufacture a result out of what you could possibly do in five days. So Australia came out. Really tight contest with the ball. Well, England bowled well, I'm going to say. And ended up setting a target of 270 from 40 over, 50 overs, I think it was. Yeah, so it was uh, 257 mm. yeah. from, uh, I'm just having a quick look now, uh, 48 overs. Yeah, so, so basically sixes. Yeah, so, so it's it's at a, you know, five and a half runs and over, which is a pretty decent clip for a test match. And so that doesn't, for those who watch a lot of cricket and a lot of one-day cricket, that doesn't sound so bad, but you've got to remember that this is on a fourth-day pitch, so that means that there's cracks forming, the pitch is a lot drier, even though there's been rain, um, it's, it, it's starting to show some uneven bounce, um, so it makes it a lot more difficult to bat. Of course, then as well, you're using, you don't have the fielding restrictions, so you can put players all the way out if you want, or all the way in, so you've got a lot more flexibility with the field, which makes it, in general harder to score and yeah. I'll go say as well it was a really brave declaration yes now I'll, we'll come back around to that discussion mm. at the end because what happened next was something I don't think anyone was really prepared for <laughs> England what? tried to chase the total and they yes. got mighty close they got incredibly close at some point they were what was it? It was thirty from thirty with four wickets in hand. It, well, I mean, even before before Nat Skiver got out, so it got to a point uh, where England were three, uh, two down, uh, mm. chasing well, uh, two down chasing the total for one hundred and sixteen. So that's they were three quarters of the way through their innings, one hundred and sixteen. So still another hundred, uh, one hundred and sixty six. Sorry, still another hundred or so to get. But you've got fifteen overs to get them in. Then 
Nat Siver and well, it was really Sophia Dunkley came out. She went full T20 mode. She started hitting them everywhere. She accelerated to 45 off of 32 balls. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you could see the Australians get tense. They were like, oh no, we're in trouble. Yeah. Because the momentum went all the way to England. Oh, this was England's game to win at this point. Um, That was until Annabelle Sutherland got the ball. And yes, she really changed the game. So we'll set we'll set the yep. stage. It was forty five needed from ten overs when mm-hmm. Sutherland came into ball to bowl. Yep, first wicket down. Nat Scott, Nat Stever, after a brilliant fifty eight caught from the caught Meg Lanning bowled Sutherland. Yep, so that's caught, so that's four down. Uh, not long after that, Amy Jones is a dangerous batsman as well. Bat, bats batter, I should say. Get yep. it right, Chris. <laughs> Caught Mooney, bowled Sutherland. That was literally two overs up to her next over. Then Sophia Duckley went out next over to to, to King. She it was it was King. an incredible catch in the deep. Mm, this it so was it was a huge, massive uh, straight drive, lofted straight drive. Mm. Uh, and Beth Mooney, uh, who was an Australian batswoman, who. A week prior, had a plate put in her jaw after she she was uh, batting in the nets and a ball hit her in the jaw and broke her jaw. So she missed mm-hmm. she missed the T Twenty games. A plate in her jaw runs forward, takes a diving catch in front of her, and mm-hmm. the reaction from the crowd, the reaction from me, the reaction from the commentators was absolutely off the charts. And it yeah. was it was hilarious as well because uh, in the commentary team were two Australia two former Australian. Uh, women's cricketers and one English women cricketer and I'm just going to copy this image and uh, drop it in the the live chat um, but basically you can see the two Australians just on their feet fist bumping and the English woman Isha Gua has a look of shock she's holding her heart her <laughs> eyes her she's got a hand yep. over her face it's just incredible just the drama of this moment yes even after that amazing wicket I still thought England were a chance. Catherine Brunt was still out there. And uh, as well, they only needed a runner ball at this point as well. Mm. They were uh, uh, 236 and they yeah. had four overs left, which is 24 balls. So they only yeah. needed to get another 20 runs. Mm. Problem was the very first ball of that 24, Catherine Brunt went out caught behind. Oh, how the ta- uh, turn tables, Kiwi. <laughs> yes. And yet, they were still going for it. <laughs> and then there was a run out at 2.44. And then they still were going for it. But then the next ball was a quick, another catch behind of Alana King. At which point, nine down, England went, okay, we probably should save this test match now. There was actually something posted on uh, r slash cricket, the cricket subreddit, uh, funnily enough, of of a transcript of the uh, the last wicket discussion so the the last batter Kate Cross came out to take take the pitch uh and Sophie Eccleston who was at the at the wicket said to her oh so so what's the message uh and Cross said we have to save it we don't get out we absolutely do not get out and England batted out the test match similar to the men's uh ashes uh earlier on in the summer they batted out the test match they finished the test nine down and they won a draw Although, to be fair, a draw was a really fitting result. Um, that last diver, though, I do want to focus. I do want to focus on that because they needed what was it? Twelve. 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 Yes, needed twelve. Why do you still have five people in the deep? So I, I can justify. I, I think I can justify what Meg's thinking. Thinking. Okay. You want to make sure you don't lose. So right. if you if you start the over with five people out in the deep. You can go okay. So even if if they try to hit a six, we can stop it. We can catch it. We can do something. So we start there. Once we once it's less likely that we're going to lose, we bring the field up. And there was a, a great picture of Amanda Wellington who was sitting in the stands for this, actually like indicating get up, get bring the field in. And like by the end of that over, they had you know all nine fielders within five meters of the batsman, batswoman rather. Only for Alana King to bowl the grossest full toss I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, it was it was pretty anticlimactic. Let's uh, let's be real. 
It was, but it was an it, it was an ing, ing, ignoble end to a fascinating test match, which leads me to think two things. Yes. One. Four day test matches work only if you have a fifth reserve day. Yep. And I think four four days is perfect test match length for if you're doing four by hundred overs. Ooh. I think for, for women, I, I agree for women's test matches. I that, that was my point. That was okay. for women. I'm sorry. Okay. For, yeah. for women talking about. Yeah, sure. Or, may, or maybe between associate nations. Okay. So you start to bring in the concept of associate tests, or uh, yeah. are, we, are we talking about tests between, like, say, Ireland and Afghanistan? Yeah, exactly. That sort of stuff. Well, I mean, the, the standardized five-day test match has only been a thing since really, like, the 70s, so... Yeah. Yeah, that's very true. You had eight ball overs, four ball overs, all that sort of stuff. So I think there's scope for a four-day test only if you have a fifth day as a reserve, because if you lose 25% of your game time due to weather... That's a massive hurdle to overcome. Yeah, that that re- really the person we need to thank most for this exciting finish is Meg Lanning, the the captain absolutely. of the Australian side who declared when she did. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, uh, and I mean she got it. <laughs> she got it bang on, but boy howdy, it was close. <laughs> it was way closer than I think she wanted. So, but, um, what what do you think of the tactics of Meg Lanning then in that instance? Surely, I, like, I totally understand wanting to win a test match, but. In the grander scheme of things, would a draw have been well? Obviously, the draw is the end result, but would a draw have would playing for a draw have been such a bad idea? From her point of view, I can understand why you'd want to go for the win because a win in this test match means you've won the Ashes. That's done. Yeah. Okay. A loss means you still only need to win two one days of the three. Does it? Well, yeah, because you've got you've got two points from the one you've won. You're down 4-2. You're defending the Ashes. You only have to get to six points. So you're going to win two one days. Yeah, two one days of the three. Okay. So, and Australia will do that. I can't see how they won't. Yeah, so Australia is the current (laughs) cricket world champions in the one-day format and have just lost the longest streak of uh, t- uh, one-day uh, wins uh, to India, who uh, played in Australia in October. So, sorry, they didn't lose the streak. Their streak ended, is a better way of saying that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think right I need to go for it. Even with a draw, England still realistically need to win. Well, mathematically, they need to win all three. That's that's the or, thing. Or, or have two with a washout. That's, yeah, win... Win two and have the last washed out. Yeah. So that's that's the thing that I would say uh, that it would have been smarter to have batted longer, make the draw the most likely uh, result, because then you're basically putting yourself into a position where it's hard to lose the Ashes. Um, so all for all for going for glory to win the Ashes, but in in a situation where you're, you know, all four results are on the table, I. Maybe this is me being boring and negative, but you know, I expected Meg to bat longer and put themselves into a position where they now can't lose the Ashes by effe- yeah. by effectively drawing the Test match and saying, "Okay, England, you have to win all three One Day Internationals against the World Champions." Yeah, but I think it's a refreshing change. Someone who's willing to take the game by the scruff of the neck, you know, and have a go. Like we saw it with the men; they didn't enforce a follow-on when it was the obviously the easiest choice. You know, they've played really conservative and just ground out England and just ground them to, to a pulp. Mm. Yeah. Which, there's two ways to cut the fish here. Fair enough. Um, maybe maybe that's me being a bit more conservative and a bit more, uh, uh, like, you know, avoiding a loss rather than going for the win. Um, but, like, hey, props to her. And I, I hope this brings more... Cricket, like more test cricket for women because it was an awesome, it was an enthralling four days. Yeah, and this is going to be my other point. Yes, there needs to be more women's cricket. I had a thought that what, and this multi format system I like, I really like. So I was thinking, and you can tell me if this is stupid, and you wouldn't do this for every series. For example, you wouldn't want to destroy the men's ashes. Mm. Let's say Australia, New Zealand, men, women. 
they both play a multi-format series. They can play at the same time. So, for example, you could have a woman's test with men playing T20 at night in one week, alternate it next week. Two tests, two one days, three 2020s. And then there's just one champion, one champion at the end. I think that would work well to give those teams who don't play a lot of test cricket more meaningful games than just having a buy that or a two test series all the time. As well as showcase the women's game more and really just make it a more of a spectacle. You know what? I don't hate it. I like, sure, like, obviously you can't do that with, like, the Ashes because the Ashes is its mm. own prestigious thing. But, yeah. yes, yes, certainly for, for like, uh, you know, Australia versus Ireland or, uh, like, even some of the I... smaller nations like versus Bangladesh or versus Sri Lanka or, mm. you know, maybe even, like, I know, because I know that Australia generally only plays three test series with uh, South Africa. Do, an, uh, do that sort of tour with South Africa because the South African women's setup is probably the second or third best setup in the world. Yeah. So Australia versus India uh, versus South Africa in the women's game, that's a that's a battle of the heavyweights, effectively. Yeah. So you can have, you know, first week, you men, you men play your test, women play T20 or whatever, can culminate with a double header T20 at the end. It'd be great. I'm I'm so on board for that. We need someone, whoever ICC. We need someone get the ICC on the phone. Hey ICC, I am looking for a full time job. <laughs> He's got a family do, to support. I do I do have a sports management degree. ICC, here's my phone number: oh four five zero. <laughs> oh, brilliant! Uh, there was also some other big cricket uh, happenings in the world. Uh, in your corner of the world, uh, you had uh, over in New Zealand the Test series against Bangladesh, and yes. uh, that Test series ended. Do you, you guys won that Test series, right? Just no, no, no. no. So remember, remember last episode how I was saying Bangladesh had just been to their first inning score. Yes. They ended up beating New Zealand quite convincingly in the first test. Ooh. So second test, Tom Latham's gone, bugger this, and scored 250 on his own. Wow. <laughs> and we ended up winning that one inside three days, I think it was, in the end. Yeah, uh, so it was only a two-test series in the end? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So it was tied, tied series, but it was another significant moment for you guys, and that was the end of the career of one of New Zealand's best and longest-serving serv- uh, players... Uh, Chris, I think it's better if you tell the story. Yes, it's indeed. Now, I'm just going to... I want to get his name right. So, it was the last test series for Lutero Ross Patua Lotto Taylor. That's that's a lot of names. It's like yes. uh, Chiminda uh, Vass and all of his names. Yes. So, yeah. Known to everyone as Ross Taylor. Played his last test series, his last test match in Christchurch in the second test. He uh, he did okay. I think he made a couple of scores and he made a score in the thirty. Because he's even only batted once. He also <laughs> took the last wicket of the game. <laughs> and Taylor's not really known for his bowling, is he? No, he is not. <laughs> and you had the whole crowd screaming, give Ross a ball, give Ross a ball. We're getting to the end of the day. They're nine down. So Tom Lathis is like, you know what? Here you go. Have the ball. See what you can do. <laughs> Cause the catch and then at mid on. What an absolute legend. And it was, and like, I've seen, there was a very specific video taken from that crowd who were cheering, give, give Ross the ball, give Ross the ball. And the roar that went up when he got that wicket was, oh, how good a sport. Oh, how good a sport. And it's the best thing I think I've ever seen at Hagley Park since I was there in person for a game of cricket mats. Oh, that's cute. (laughs) It was so cool. Just give a bit of context of what... Ross Taylor sort of means to New Zealand cricket because he's he's been around for a long time. Is he New Zealand's best ever batsman? No, no. Is is he no. in the conversation? He's definitely in the conversation. But I can think of people who would be better than him. But 112 tests, 233 one days, averaging 44 in tests, 48 in one day. He he did have his moments where he went up and down. Uh, a lot of it was around his eye surgery, but I think he is, and also in the field, he was one of the, 
I think one of the better fielders we've had as well. Yeah, absolutely. Just a note on that eye surgery. It's interesting mm. you mentioned that. He really had a career of two halves because after mm. he had his eye surgery, which was in 2016, so uh, six years prior to the end of his career, he started his average since then went up to 81.6 in test cricket and 60.5 in one day. Is. Yeah. So you imagine Which if he is- had, had working eyes to start his career, he'd be like Bradman-esque. Yeah, uh, he would be. Um, he is New Zealand's most prolific run scorer. Uh, having said that, Kane Williamson is second on that list with 26 less matches. So Williamson is expected to pass that mark, certainly. Yep, yep certainly. Uh, then the next three on the list is Stephen Fleming, Brendan McCullum, and Martin Crowe. And those would be the three names that I would think would be in that conversation for best New Zealand batsman as well. Yeah. So, he is an absolute legend of the game. We're going to miss him. Ab- absolutely. And it's a shame that the uh, the situation with the Australian COVID border closures meant that the one-day series that was meant to be played between Australia and New Zealand hasn't gone ahead because that would have been his swan song and I think would have been a, a, a very uh, sort of a nice way to end a career, you know, playing Australia and, you know. I, I, was, I was all ready to go to the MCG, even if my partner was in labour. <laughs> and that tells you how important this man is to, to New Zealand cricket. A, a question yeah. for you, Kiwi. Mm-hmm. D- does the fact that he is of uh, Maori descent have any sort of bearing on his popularity or his unpopularity or anything like that? I, I think it makes him more popular. Because we don't have many cricketers of Samoan Maori descent in, in New Zealand. It's just not what they play. They, they go and play rugby. They yeah. bash, bash them up sports. And New Zealand are very good at rugby. Yes. Uh, so to have some to have someone with his with his background playing a sport like cricket brings up a lot more of the of the Maori population through the sport. And I think. That's, that's That can only be a good thing, right? Yeah, absolutely. There's an old saying that I've seen go around in a bunch of different contexts recently is you, you can't be what you can't see. And so for for New Zealand uh, kids seeing a Maori, uh, well, New, Maori New Zealand, in New Zealand kids seeing a Maori player in test matches being the best in the team or for Australian, uh, Indigenous Australian kids seeing Scott Boland come on and bowl and take probably the best uh, the best spell of his entire career in his first game in front of a packed house at the MCG, or Ash Barty, who is of um, Indigenous descent uh, in Queensland, going ahead and being uh, winning the Australian Open in front of a, a home crowd, a very supportive home crowd, can inspire those who might not see a lot of their representation into those sports and into those categories and drive more representation. And boy, that's so cool! Yeah, I mean, he it's so cool. Let's be honest, he is more Samoan than Maori, but... Okay, my mistake, sorry. But, but even so, similar concept. Yeah, exactly. You know, there's only been four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven cricketers who are, who you could say are Maori. One of them's been Stokes. Oh, really? He's, yeah. I knew that he was New Zealand born, but I didn't realise... <laughs> huh, there you go. There's a bit of, bit of that in him. Um, so, yeah. It's, I'm gonna I'm gonna miss him. And the I, team's definitely gonna be weaker as a result. Yeah, it's uh, a massive hole to fill. And I I think the cricketing the cricketing landscape is gonna miss him. He was certainly oh, a, yeah. such a such an important part of the New Zealand cricket setup. Yeah, um, yeah. Hey, but if he can go to India for a couple of years, make some coin. Nice. That's always a good thing. Uh, we'll move on from the cricket because we still want to talk about plenty and we're running out of time. Uh, the first thing I want to get to is, on the note of Ash Barty, there ain't no party like an Ash Barty party. Woo! He How was... good was the Australian Open? <laughs> After all the crap we went through with the Novak Dokovic... Let's not even garbage. mention his name. Let's just forget about it. <laughs> yeah. What a tournament. And Ash Barty, what a tournament she had. I think coming into the final, she dropped what twenty three games. Yeah, she she not lost a, she'd not lost a set, and she'd only had her serve broken twice. And so, so for for those who don't understand tennis, these are all very impressive. Yeah. So coming to the final against who I thought was a very impressive player himself, uh, Daniel, Daniel Collins. Yeah. 
Yeah. 21st seed in, in that respect. She's actually mm. taken down, I think, the seventh seed and another high mm. place seed on her way to get to the final. So a pretty impressive result from her as well. Yeah. And actually played well in that second set. She was, what was it? Five two up at some at, the, at one point. Five one up, and I remember. Five, one up, yes. I remember listening. I was listening to the commentary at the time, and they said that for, in comparison to the first set to the second set, the real difference was that Collins' serve had gone from fifty percent uh, in, so fifty percent of first serves mm-hmm. in, and generally the the strongest uh, shot in tennis is your first serve to eighty eight percent. And so that was what the key difference was. And that was how she was able to race away to such a lead. Barty basically had no chance on Collins' serve, which meant that all of the pressure was on Barty's serve, which was why she lost so many points. But yeah, the, the comeback, though, the comeback after that to go from 5-1 down to then level at 6-all to, to win the tiebreak was just, ha, huh, ha. Huh. It's the stuff. It's, it, it, this is why we watch sport. This is exactly why we watch sport and exactly why we watch just a fantastic Australian sports person who's well loved in the community, which is not often you say that about Australian tennis players. Yeah. I like that's an, there's an interesting discussion to be had about how much narcissism you need to be a tennis player, but that's yes. something beyond the scope of this podcast right now. But Ash, Ash isn't narcissistic. So. She's not. She's just, she's Australia's darling. It's beautiful. Yeah. The most explicit example of her being Australia's darling was during the COVID lockdown, uh, she decided not to spend, not to go over to France and defend her Roland Garros title. Um, She decided that it would be better for her to stay in Australia, better for her mental health. And then there were pictures of her at the Brisbane Lions game, sinking uh, sinking beers and cheering on her team. (laughs) Like That's how you endear yourself to Australians. Beers and footy. (laughs) Yep. <laughs> Sorry for Australian. interrupting you. You're good. So, uh, yeah, first Australian to win the Australian Open since 1973, I think it was. Yeah. And to be surprised by her idol, Yvonne Gulligan Gullig- Gullig- Cawley, at the end there. Like, she had no idea she was coming. And, and like, that as well was the last uh, Australian woman to win the Australian Open. And that was such a touching moment um, by the organisers to organise that. An indigenous person, you know, indigenous sports person as well. And they did that all in secret because she wasn't going to come down citing ill health. And they made it happen. No one knew about it. It was just an amazing moment, that hug. It was it was brilliant. It, it'd be like it'd be like uh, someone being able to you know see their their sporting idol at their yeah, yeah. absolute peak. Like that was it, what it was. It was mm. the, her peak. She just won the Australian Open, and she's been given the trophy by the four time winner of the Australian of the Australian Open that she absolutely idolizes. That's been an inspiration and a mentor through her, through her entire career. It's such a beautiful thing. And I have to say as well, Danielle Collins gave the best runners up speech I've ever heard. It was so classy. It was classy. Yeah. She was just so thankful to be there. I don't think it's the last time we'll see her at a Grand Slam final either. Just oh, a- absolutely not. Uh, she, <clears> she's she got success in her career coming up. But I think what she realized was that it wasn't her moment. So, no, no. I, I, And I think she did a very good job of being appreciative to be a part of the moment while knowing the moment wasn't ever about her. And that's yeah. something that's something that is really classy. <laughs> <laughs> and like, and it sounds it sounds super like arrogant as well to be like this. None of this is about you. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, Danielle. We know you've just lost <laughs> lost a Grand Slam final, but none of this is about you right now. Um, yeah, oh, but, but she she can she can dry her eyes with a cool million that she won for coming second. I mean, yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> um, I mean, I was watching watching a video of some eight sixteen year old girl who found out from Channel Nine that she won quarter of a million for making the third round. Oh, wow. So, you know, money. So what you're saying is I should have been a tennis player. Yeah, even if you make the first round, it's like a hundred grand. God damn. <laughs> so, uh, no, but Ash Barty, absolute legend. And that wasn't I, even the the most exciting story of the game, of the Open. No, not at all. What? <laughs> Where do we go next? It's... Ah uh, well, you had the you had the Aussie all Aussie doubles final. That was a story in its own right. I don't really want to talk about that because that bores me. I'll, I'll just quickly make a, make a few things. Yeah. Uh, two things. One, both teams were giant slayers. Like, uh, oh yeah. Uh, 
Ebden and Purcell took down the number two seed. Uh, Kyrgios and Kokonakis mm. took down the number one seeds like True. on their way to win, which was huge. The final itself was kind of tense. Like yeah. the, the, the fact you would have thought that like an all Australian final would have been like, everyone would have been all mates out there, but it, there was this really weird cultural divide. Like I, I was talking to a friend about it and she basically said you had the Wogs which were Kyrgios and Kokonakis, who, for those who are unaware, that's like an Australian uh, Australian Mediterranean descent. So Greeks, Italians, Croatians, those, uh, you know, it's a very particular group, a cultural phenomenon, which I am sometimes not proud to be a part of, but totally proud to be a part of it that <laughs> night, versus like the, the traditional Anglo-Saxon uh, Australians on the other end. So there was this very like distinct cultural divide in in that final and it was infuriating to watch how how douchey uh Kokonakis and Kyrgios were but they won and it was good exactly I think and I think it brings to light something that I think is missing from tennis at the moment you don't have that team environment that really patriotic oh yeah we're we're gonna fight for our country sort of thing ever since the Davis Cup got moved to its bullshit format that it is now. Yeah, and, like, I, that's something that we don't really see a lot of in tennis either, like, uh, well, just at all, because it's very much an, an individual sport. Like, uh, as yeah. much as as much as you're yeah. representing your country, it's really about the individual, so... But, but the Davis Cup used to be, you know, Spain would come to Australia. It'd be 95% Australians in the crowd going absolutely off their chops, you know? Yeah, when Argentina came here, there was almost a fight between Nobanian and Hewitt, that sort of thing. Yeah, that, well, I mean, that's because it's, Hewitt's a knob and Nobanian's a bigger knob. <laughs> yeah. But, but, like, yeah, no, I totally get what you mean. You don't you don't get that, you don't seem to get that passion anymore because it's in the Middle East and no one is there. Yeah. And it's just three setters, just not even reverse singles. It's not what it was, and I do miss it. And I think the special K has kind of brought that back a bit with the crowd. Yeah, it, it kind of removed a bit of the uptightness around tennis yeah, yeah. which there is a lot of there is That's and true. i don't i don't have a problem with the crowd were generally behaving like yes you had some knobs who were evicted but that's a good thing for sport in general i i liken it to like the party hole and i think it's the uh phoenix open okay in the golf where they just surround the 16th green with grandstands everyone's drinking and being merry and just having a good old time so what you're saying is you want you want tennis to become like uh, McPhillamy Park at Bathurst? <laughs> like, <nah. laughs> I, I think I think the people at SW19 might have a problem with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, we'll leave that one on now. Um, men's final though, uh, what a game that was the men's final. Uh, Me- uh, Daniel Medvedev who was the villain of the Open uh, versus uh, Rafael Nadal, who broke the record for the most amount of Grand, St- uh, grand Slams won by um, by anyone, by a human, to, to, to step ahead of Federer and Djokovic in, in the big three. But what a game. Medvedev had, oh. had the whole run of it the first two sets, and it looked like Rafael was down and out, but he turned it around. It was incredible. I don't understand how he did that. <laughs> he's 30 trillion years old he shouldn't be able to do that but yet he did and and it was only what two or three months ago that he was nursing a broken foot or a foot problem and like had surgery and was on crutches as well so like the, the fact that he's managed to come back and just build into his game and get to that final it, like you got to the fourth set and I had the feeling like there's there's no way he loses this he's just got yeah. so much momentum going now yeah so just on midnight uh, I know you were dipping out and out of the, uh, Daytona, of the Daytona, yeah. Daytona, as you should have been, but I was asleep. <laughs> Put it on a replay. The Everyone writes off Rafa at their peril. The fact he's still doing this now, and not at the French Open, which I think is obviously his favourite and his most... His pet event, um, really. His pet event and the service, which I think is kindest to his body. I did, I did not see this coming. I did not think he'd be the first of 21. Okay, I, I I think that's fair. Um, I guess the okay, I'll, I'll be truly upfront and honest. I've always been a Rafa stan. In the in the big three, I've always liked Rafa the most, and that's probably because 
Federer beat Hewitt, and that was before I realized Hewitt was a, a knob, so I was like, ah, oh, <laughs> you're the worst. Um, and then Rafa came on the scene, and he was beating Federer, so I'm like, yeah. Um, so I've always been a Rafa stand, but I've honestly been surprised how long they, those two particularly, less so Djokovic because he came on the scene later, but those two particularly have been at the top of tennis. I don't think I can look at any other sport and see a group, a, a, an individual or a group of players who have been the top, the absolute peak of tennis for the past 20 years, really. Because it's 20 years. Yeah. Like, that, that yeah. to me is the most surprising thing. So it doesn't necessarily surprise me that they've got 20 Grand Slams each, because if you're going to be at the top of the sport for 20 years, of course you're going to have 20 Grand Slams each. <laughs> yes. I, I think it, it is pretty phenomenal, but it makes me think how high can these guys go, because Federer is, I think he's done now. I can't see him winning another Grand Slam. I don't even think he would even play that much more tennis, to be honest. Yeah, it's I, this might be the straw that breaks the yeah. Fed Express, unfortunately. Yeah, the um, Rafa, I, I, I don't want to say he's got no time left because he just won a bloody thing, but you just don't know. And who knows if Djokovic will even be allowed to play a Grand Slam anytime soon. Well, certainly not getting let back in Australia. No. And let's so, leave that conversation alone. So really, it is up to people like Med- Medvedev to step up. He's got the ability, but my God, does he not have the temperament. He was very he, much the villain of the Australian Open. And like, just, oh my gosh, the when he went off at the, the crowd in the mm-hmm. final, I was like, oh boy, that's not a wise decision. When he went off at the ball kids. Yeah, like even more so than going off the crowd, going off the ball kids. Yeah, that, that just, no. <laughs> you may, that's basically like kicking a cat. That just don't do it. That's like if the motor, uh, if a if a driver started going off at the marshals. Like everyone respects the marshals. They are the reason that you can do what you do for a living. Like, so, and that's what ball boys do and girls and girls. <laughs> so, uh, he was. I, dad- I am very glad that Nadal won. Medvedev mm-hmm. played his part perfectly, and I hope to never see him again. <laughs> yeah, keep an eye out for keep an eye out for Sinner. He'll be the one to watch. Who's that? Italian, sorry? Young, young Italian bloke, Sinner. Yeah, uh, he because yeah. he he got to the semi-finals. He was the one that uh, mm. Rafa uh, beat, didn't he? Yeah, he is going to be one for the future. And Tsitsipas as well, the other semi-finalist. Yep. yep. Who enjoyed a lot of support because Wogs. <laughs> yeah, we are like that. <laughs> um, so, good to say as well. Five hours and twenty four minutes as a as a Australian Open final. I I made a decision to uh, to watch that final, and it was a good decision. But boy, did I pay for it the next day! <laughs> After doing six hours of work covering Daytona uh, as well, uh, eight hours of work actually. Thank eight you very much. much. Bloody hell! And then going straight to my full time job at, at seven o'clock the next morning. The game finished at uh, one uh, thirty in the morning my time. Yeah, oh. yeah, and this is. After they changed the fifth set tiebreak rules to try and shorten the length of these final games. Oh boy! <laughs> How good's the tennis? Anyway, of course, of I course. Hate- like like most Australians, I'll completely forget that tennis exists until about the fourth of January next year, and do this all again. Yeah. Do we have time to quickly talk about Dylan Norcott? Yes, quickly. Yep. Yes, he lost his final in his last tournament, but that wasn't the most imp- important thing for him. He was actually named Australian of the Year. Which is pretty cool. Which is very cool. And the fact he went to Canberra mid- mid-tournament, the day before the final, <laughs> for the, for the uh, presentation. And I don't even think he was too fussed about being Australian of the Year. Like, of, course, of course, obviously it's a, it's a big deal. But mm. so for those who are unaware, Dylan Oldcott is a uh, wheelchair tennis player. Um, I'm not sure what condition he has, but he does not have use of his legs. Um, and also one hand's got nerve damage as well okay i did not realize that um that's why he can play that's why he could compete in the quad yes right as opposed to as opposed to wheelchair right okay he said in his final interview that when he first won a grand slam at the australian open he wasn't even on the show courts he was in Mm. one of the 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 backwater courts but what 
he has been able to do with Tennis Australia and with the support of, well, like Australian sporting culture, because let's be real here, it probably wouldn't be such a big deal if Australians didn't care all that much about sports. But to be actually able to play his last Grand Slam final on Rod Laver Arena, the main stage, uh, admittedly, like not at prime time, but still, you know, have people watch and care about it and be invested in wheelchair tennis, uh, you know, uh, to to have, again, that representation of uh, people with disabilities, people with uh, paraplegics, people with non-functioning limbs, people with other ailments, to have that representation to show that you can play sports, you can do these things. I, and, and to get to that stage and to, to all the work that he's done for uh, for disabled people in Australia is like, it's commendable. Of course, he's Australian of the year. Yeah. And just to cement how Australian he was, his post-game interview, he had a beer in his drink bottle. <laughs> As I said, how do you get Australians on your side? Sinking beers. <laughs> uh uh, so brilliant way to to wrap up the tournament. Uh, the the two mm. well, the the three finals really the men's doubles final along with the the two singles finals plus the story around Dylan Alcott really really actually it was just a well executed tournament and I'm very very happy to well, say that we're not without a hitch and being able to get more people in as the tournament progresses well also helped. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, it was it was just it was just good. I, how good is sport? How good's the tennis? How good's the cricket? How good is sport, Chris? I've got a problem now. Mm-hmm. There's no sport. The big match is finished. The Australian Open's finished. There's nothing to watch. What am I going to watch now, Chris? Okay, I guess you can watch the AFLW if you really want. Oh, you can watch the Winter Olympics. Yeah, the Winter Olympics. <laughs> Starting this Friday. It's time of recording. A very interesting time for people on our side of the world, Chris, uh, because I don't know about you, but winter sports, I don't get to see a lot of winter sports uh, in Australia. They're not really a high profile activity uh, ac- across the Australian sporting landscape. Um, not a lot of snow in Australia. Also, it doesn't really get cold. <laughs> yes. And when there are winter sports, they're normally in Europe, which is a time zone that doesn't work for us. Yeah. It's just a little issue of being on the other side of the planet. Um, yes. New Zealand gets so- snow though, doesn't it? Yes, we do. And that's why we have 15 winter athletes, most of whom are in the freestyle events. Oh, that's not. Same with us. We've got, I think, 44 athletes, which is probably just mm. a, a, a numbers thing in terms of our bigger population. But most of them are in the freestyle events as well. Yeah, which I think just goes to show that we don't we don't go skiing for recreate. We just go skiing for recreation and to show off. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Um I I don't know about you, Chris, but I'm not a huge fan of the the freestyle events on a personal standpoint. Like I'll watch them because I love seeing Australians do well in sports, but freestyle for me isn't really my jam. What what's your what's your jam in the Winter Olympics? What do you really get excited about? There's two things I really get excited about. Curling. Woo! <laughs> and the sliding events. So uh like bobsled, luge, those sort of things. I've said lose skeleton, skeleton, and I guess I count short track, short track speed skating as well because my god, is that messy? That is terrifying. <laughs> that is in- yes. brilliant and terrifying. Uh, of yes. course, the story of one of Australia's greatest sporting heroes uh, was born on the short track, oh, short track speed skating circuit. Yes, indeed, Mr. Stephen Bradbury. Mr. Stephen Bradbury. Uh, yes, the uh, and in fact, an extra an Australian expression is doing a Bradbury, coming out of nowhere to win or to be successful. I, I, I love the fact that he had to do that in two rounds, not just one. Yeah, people don't realize that doing a Bradbury is actually doing a double Bradbury. Um, yeah. So for those who who don't know the story of Steve Bradbury, we'll do a quick history lesson here. Uh, world Championship speed skater from Australia was one of the best in the world. Um, crashed and broke his neck. Uh, in like just before the his first Olympics, had a really crap time in a bunch of other Olympics. He basically had a stellar career without doing well at the Olympics, and he got to his last Olympics at Salt Lake in America in 2002, beat the reigning world champion in one of the qualifying rounds, got to the semifinals, basically just trawled around at the back, stayed at everyone's way. They all crashed, and he went across to win, went into the final, very, very famously stayed at the very, very back, Everyone crashed on the final corner and he went across to win. And if you like, if you look up, there's a brilliant video um, called, oh, what's it called? It's a YouTube video 
Last Man Standing. If you YouTube Stephen Bradbury Last Man Standing, it's a great little piece on his I like his speed skating journey as well as that final as well. So check that out. Well worth. Absolutely. But yeah, so Sorry. Sorry for that history lesson. <laughs> oh, oh good. So that's what I'm looking forward to you. I I can guess what you're looking forward to, and I'm gonna assume it involves the words Athlon and Bi. <laughs> yes, I'm. I have become a biathlon fan, and it's because of the the, the last Winter Olympics. Actually, I uh, came across it in the broadcast. And said, "Hey, this is really really cool." I sat down. What actually sat down and watched two events and was sold. And since then, I've been following the the biathlon uh, circuit for the last four years. Um, and uh, biathlon, for those of you who aren't aware, I actually I've got I've got a bunch of notes here. I've got like a bunch of explaining notes um to to take us to to give me something to refer to so i don't get these wrong because i would hate to be like like all the europeans listening go oh he's got that wrong he's got that wrong that would be the worst they're gonna do that that anyway i've seen the facebook comments oh don't (laughs) that's that's another issue um so biathlon it's a a a dual sport of shooting and skiing cross-country skiing um so it's basically uh you've got a you've got this very intensive aerobic endurance sport of cross-country skiing um, where you're doing two to three Ks of skiing each time. And then you've got to slow all that down and do a very precision movement in shooting. Um, So it's... uh, Do you want to know uh, all these things about biathlon, Chris? I've got a list. Do it. Do it. I'm in for the history lesson. You're in... uh, Well, uh, not so much a history lesson, but uh, so uh, in so much as how the sports work. So, like, not only are you skiing, but you're carrying around a three and a half kilogram rifle, uh, which uh, has to remain unloaded until you're on the range, uh, which fires 22 rounds. Well, you want to want it loaded while you're traveling. Right, if you fall over. I mean, exactly. But there's, like, you know, occasions where bullets get left in chambers but if you like if that happens if you step off the range with a bullet left in your chamber you basically get disqualified on the spot um Good. yeah exactly so it's a big safety thing of that because of course you're using a weapon um so you've got that on your back uh there's uh so you, you do a loop of cross-country skiing you come in to shoot so you've got to shoot five targets from 50 meters away um and there's two shooting positions you're either lying down prone or you're standing um, and you don't do them at the same time. So you come in, you do a lap, do a prone shoot, do a lap, do a standing shoot, and then do a lap to the finish effectively. Um, so uh, for the prone, for, so for lying down on the ground, for prone, the targets are 45 millimeters across, which is about the size of a golf ball. Um, so you're basically hitting a golf ball from 50 meters away. Um, and for the standing shoot, they're 105, uh, 115 millimeters across. So, like a cricket ball, effectively. Because I can barely hit a golf ball when I'm standing next to it with a golf club. Doing it over 50 meters? Jesus. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. Um, uh, like, something that's very, very interesting is a lot of the athletes will have a smartwatch which will show their heart rate, and watching their heart rate uh, be so high and it drop as they're going through the shooting pattern is really, really interesting. You can kind of see when someone's works too hard on on the skiing because that's that's the whole name of the game it's actually trying to find a way to ski at a level that doesn't affect your shooting because if you miss targets you get penalties you got to ski uh penalty loops which are 150 meters long so not only do you lose time you've actually got to ski more so you get more tired which would suck yes um uh. So, yeah, and there's a bunch of different uh, specific disciplines. So there's like four different types of individual race and then uh, relays as well, which has its own rules. Um, But it's super duper interesting. There's a bunch of like uh, explaining uh, videos online. I think even the Olympics put out a how does this sport work thing online. Um, So that'll be cool. Um, And uh, go the Swedes. uh, The Swedes are my adopted team and I think they will win something. They'll win something. They're likely to be the more prominent. Are we going to see other European nations like the Russians or well, athletes from Russia? So, do you want an actual form guide? Because I've got an actual form guide that I can give you. I can really prepare it. Let's do it. So, uh, in the in the men's tour or in the men's side of things, uh, you're basically your two big powerhouses are Norway and uh, and France at the moment. Um, so, yeah, you wouldn't really expect France. I didn't really think France as a big skiing nation but they've had some really notable athletes in the past so someone who's just retired in the last 
24 months has been Martin Fourcard, who uh, won, he's won the most biathlon events in its in the sport's history. So, Even I know that name. Yeah, exactly. There you go. So he's uh, he recently retired, but that what that's allowed is that it's like allowed the young bloods of the French team to really step up, and they've all stepped up. So the likes of um, Quentin Fiomaye and Emilien Jacquelin, um, those sort. Of, I think those two are probably the strongest on the French team. Um, on the other hand, for the Norwegians, you've got uh, Johannes Tingisbo, who's won the overall category, basically won the championship the last three years running, but he's had a bit of an off year this year. Um, he's not leading the championship like he has done most other years. Um, but in saying that, though, at the last round of the World Cup at Antholtz, uh, which is at altitude, because the biathlon range in Beijing is at altitude, um, and that's important because there's less oxygen, which means yeah, it, it sucks to ski, and your recovery is slower, which means it's harder to shoot. At the last round, he basically just bossed everyone and was... Fast skiing faster than everyone and shooting more accurate than everyone. So I wouldn't be surprised to see him win an event, at least one. On the women's side, it's really a similar sort of story because uh, Norway has had the run of things with uh, Marta Osblu Rosalind, who has done a four card in the women's side. She's basically won everything all year. But her biggest challenges are actually going to be a pair of sisters from Sweden, um, the Erberg sisters, Hannah and Elvira Erberg, who have been the two most consistent skiers and shooters outside of Rosalind. And all three of them elected actually to miss the last round of the series at Anholtz to prepare for the Olympics. Um, so it will be interesting to see whether or not they're, they're a bit underdone compared to those who, who raced at Anholtz. Oh. Oh, Lefoy might actually give that a watch. Uh, that, is that, when is that coming up? Is that later on in the games? Or so, that... so there is an event almost every day from day one on the 5th of okay. February all the way through to the final. And they, they schedule it very interestingly because they do a lot of the, like, the mixed events, the mixed relay, the single mixed relay, which is different um, at the very beginning to sort of, like, get the energy up. And then they'll do the, um, the sprint and the pursuit, which is basically a mass start, but a rally. So, like, you have the sprint event and then... Uh, the top 60 from the sprint event do the pursuit, which is against each other, but your ti- your starting time is set by how far you're behind in the sprint. So it's really, really interesting. So it's a bit of a pursuit, a proper pursuit. Style. Yeah, like it's it's a pursuit. Like it's it's you know you 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 lost by 40 seconds or you start 40 seconds behind. It's super cool. Um, and then like through the middle of the week they have like the individuals the, like the big proper endurance event, and then they finish with the mass starts. And the mass starts are like the best most fun most exciting parts of biathlon like having everyone start at the same time and just come into the range together it's just it's always exciting yeah awesome it's, that might have to keep an eye out for that absolutely watch biathlon it's friggin' cool and like for, yeah. for those who want like like endurance racing it has that sort of like uh endurance sort of thinking aspect to it as well you know how hard do you push now to pay for later that sort of thing so yeah, I quite like it. And just like endurance racing, my favourite events make it where you go really f***ing fast. <laughs> yes, brilliant. So, so uh, of, of the sliding events, Chris, which is your favourite? I like them all for different reasons. I'm, I'm now going to ask you a question here. Of the three sliding events, which would you find the scariest? I think it has to be... Luge is the one where you're going face down, right? Wrong. So, so you get, skeleton's the one where you're going face first. That one. Skeleton, okay, I'm going to explain something to you here. So bobsleigh, obviously, you're in a missile. Yeah, you can stop that. You can you know, you, you have brakes. You can slow it down. Skeleton, you have a running start. You're sliding head first. It's not the most aerodynamic position. Plus, you've got your feet. You can use to slow you down if you need to. Luge, you go on your back. You have no brakes. It's the fastest and the scariest. I I, I don't like either of those options. <laughs> Basically, that... with the loot, you're using your shoulders to turn, and to stop it, you have to grab it from the front and pull it up. Oh gosh! And you're not going to be doing that when doing 150 k's around this track. 150 k's? Oh my gosh! It could be that high. Um, so this track, it's a Kunz. Kunstbahn track, which means it's artificial. Yeah, okay. It's a 
It's actually the first track in the world that's got a 360-degree corner in it. Huh, that's dope. <laughs> um, so, and, it, and its maximum gradient is 16 degrees. So you're going to be going quick. 16 degrees, that's like almost the banking on the tri-oval. Yeah, at, at, at points. Far out. Um, so and, 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 that's not, and that's not like corner banking, that's like elevation mm. banking, right? Uh, both. Hot damn. So it's, it's going to be fast. It's going to be pretty crazy. Uh, I think since 2010, they've been a little bit hesitant to make it super dangerous because obviously that's when the Georgian Luja um, crashed off the and, track. Crashed and died. Yeah. Which is not something we ever want to see in sport. Well, mm-hmm. ever want to see full stop, let alone in sport. Yeah. So I, I really enjoy watching all of these. And for me as well, especially with the skeleton, it's the most accessible of the three. So you get some really interesting competitors. For example, there's a skeleton, I don't know what you call them, slider, from American Samoa. Huh. Okay. Who actually ran in the 100 meters in the Tokyo Olympics. So is are we going to see a um a, a Samoan uh, cool runnings in the next 20 years or something along those lines then? Who knows? There's also a slider from Brazil. And Again, a country Vir- known for its snow. Yeah, and the Virgin Islands. Huh. Oh, there you go. What what makes yeah. Skeleton more accessible than Bobsled and Luge? Probably because it's not quite as fast. Okay. And, you have, and you sort of have that running start. So if you're quick over, you know, 20 metres, as opposed to Luge, where you're using your hands to generate pace. Yeah, okay. Um, And the, and the Bobsled, obviously, you have... you got a car. You got, you've actually got a, a car on tracks, a missile. Uh, so that's good. So that's always fun to watch, and that's starting from the tenth of Feb. Okay, so pretty late on then. Yeah, the luge is actually the first to kick off. Goes on the fifth of Feb. Okay. Uh, with the men's and women's singles, uh, there's an Australian, Australian slider in that. Nice. Uh, is there a New Zealand slider? No. No. Oh. are there any New Zealand athletes in the sliding events? No. That's a shame. There's a New Zealand biathlete. There is? Yeah. Um, Campbell Wright, I think his name is. He, like, oh, yes. only just qualified. And uh, because he he got, like, 17th in the last round of the, the World Cup. And so they were like, okay, you get, like, one slot. So he might, hmm. he might. Uh, I think he was racing in the individual, which is the endurance, uh, endurance format race. Okay, nice. Yeah. Yeah. So the luge, uh, was kicking us off, we have the men's singles and women's singles, doubles, which can be mixed gender. So yeah, two people on a luge just for added holy crapness. And then perhaps my favorite thing to watch, the team relay. Wait, relay? Yeah. So what it is, so you start with the, I can't remember the order, but you send one down, they punch the absolute shit out of a timing beacon at the bottom, which activates the gate at the top. Next person goes, <laughs> they do it again. Third, third, so you have one singles, so one man, one woman, one double. Combined time. And it's just one run, I think. That is hilarious. Soon. Yeah. So if you if you want to watch a little bit of Luge, that's a good one to watch because it's always just fun. And that's on the 10th of Feb. Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm putting that in my diary. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Great fun. Okay. That, that is then, crazy. Yeah. Then you go into Skeleton, which is just men's and women's. No doubles in the Skeleton? No. <laughs> That would be scary. I mean, it's not already. <laughs> True. And then you, from the 13th of Feb up to the end, you have the bobsleigh events. With a new event this year, uh, the woman's monobob. Okay, so I'm guessing by the name it's only one person? Yeah, one female slider. Huh, okay. Uh, that would be really interesting. I'm not, I'm yeah. not sure how a monobob works. Yeah, there's an Australian in that one as well, Bree Walker, so no doubt you'll watch that. Yeah, probably. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes. It's basically part of the IOC's equal medals for men and women. Okay, so is there like an uh, a, a, a imbalance of men's yeah. medals? Yeah, because yeah, you have the four-man, the two-man, the two-woman. Okay, yeah. And of course the four-man has got everyone's favourite team, the Jamaican bobsled team. Brilliant. So, uh, they're, they're like not uncompetitive now either. They're like a, uh, a consistent top fifteen, top ten sort of finisher. Yeah, yeah. So they, they normally hang around to do you know do well enough for a team. For again, no snow. Yes, again, Jamaica, a country renowned for its snow. 
maybe some of the freestyle events. I do remember watching the X Games recently, and I forget his name now, but I believe he came second. And someone in chat may correct me. I don't think anyone in chat knows enough about New Zealand freestyle skiers to correct you. Yeah, I'm just, trying to, I'm just having a look now. We have, I think it was, oh yeah, it was the Porteous brothers, Miguel and Nico. Okay. Uh, they'll be competing in the men's half pipe. Uh, yeah, so Miguel took home, is, has won a silver medal from the X Games. Cool. And Nico is the younger brother. He actually won bronze in 2018 when he was 16. Oh, really? And as yeah. a 16 year old? Yeah, and he won actually won gold this year at Aspen in the X Games. Nice, that's pretty cool. So he's, he's probably New Zealand's one of New Zealand's best chances. We also have someone with the best name in the snowboarding. Go on then, Cool Wakushima, as in C O O L. Okay, that's pretty cool. I mean, <laughs> oh, God damn, I can't believe I just said that. <laughs> so she'll be uh. One to keep an eye on. Another one to keep an eye on as well will be Zoe Zadowski Sinnet. She's won quite a few golds, including this year at the Winter X Games as well. Cool. Okay. So, you know, hopefully three or four medals for the New Zealanders then. Yeah. Nice. Probably more than Australia will get. I, 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 uh, hey, hey, hang on. Hang on. Well, you, well your curling team's not going to win any. Hey, I don't believe that. I think our curling team's going to win all of them. How do you curling win? How do you win curling? <laughs> <laughs> The curling, the other sport I'm intrigued by and going to be watching, the basically think lawn bowls on ice with brooms. That sounds pretty cool. Yeah, it you basically using. Have you have you ever played shuffleboard? I have not, but I've seen it played. I get the sort of concept. Yeah, so rotated rotated little disc. Try and get it to where you want it to stop on the table. Yeah. Similar concept with the stone. You put you slide along, just a little bit of English or a little bit of spin on the stone. Use the broom. Your teammates will use the broom to try and get it to either speed up or slow down friction. And to change its direction, right? Because you can actually, because yeah. they actually like water the rink before a game. So you actually get like these little frozen pellets on the top of the ice. Yeah. So all about just trying to, you know, build the friction or whatever you want to do. Get the, get the stop in the house. Because you have to be in the house to score. They have three event, three events. They've got men's, women's, which are teams of four. They're eight stones per team, and the mixed doubles, which Australia has a pairing in for the first time, which is five stones per team. Sick! I am going to be watching that. Mostly, then- mostly, I'll admit for the the wild outfits because curling has been renowned for some pretty out there uh, fashion choices. Yes, and I think. It actually starts tomorrow. Oh, really? Oh, yes, because it's a it's a like a tournament, so they actually have to start ahead of the ahead of the, mm-hmm. the ceremony to fit it in. So they, they start before the ceremony, and I think finish on the final day. Cool. Okay. Well, everyone, get some curling on your box. Um, for the Australians in the audience, we do actually have quite a few medal chances. Um, most like most likely in the aerials. Um, for Laura Peel, uh, which Australia actually has quite a storied. Um, uh, history in the in the aerials uh, with two gold medals, which is pretty cool. Um, also, also uh, in the moguls as well, which Australia has a, a bit of experience in uh, with uh, a silver medal and a gold in in the moguls, uh, and uh, probably another medal uh, in the snowball cross um, with uh, which is like the uh, like snowboard racing. I think it is. Is that snowboard cross? Yep. Yeah, so uh, hopefully gold medals in there, and then hopefully as well a gold medal in the uh, in the snowboard halfpipe um, for Scotty James, who's been uh, tearing up the international uh, X Games as well. So uh, that's that's the the chances. That's that's the hope. Um, so we might walk away with four gold medals, huh? Take that, Chris. We'll see about that. Well, exactly, and like of course we'll see every single time. That's kind of the beauty of the Olympics. It is. But it's just, yes, there aren't as many competitors. It's not as appealing, but it's still very much worth a watch. And then you have the Winter Paralympics after this, and that's another kettle of fish again. Or oh, are we even going to have time? I don't think we've got time to cover off the Paralympics. No, but watch it. That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> we'll do. Um, 
I'm just going to finish off today by telling a very, very quick story. Uh, so uh, a friend of mine uh, has recently moved in with his partner, which is really, really cool. Um, the thing is, though, he's never really been into sports at all. Like, n- no one in my immediate friend group is as into sports uh, as as I am, for example. Um, but she is. She's uh, grew up in a cricketing family. Uh, so what has been really, really cool to be a part of in the last few weeks is to be able to get to know her through sharing sport and as an extension for my mate who I've been very close to for a number of years now getting to enjoy something that he's always something that he doesn't understand he's actually finally been able to sort of understand sport and understand why people get so excited about sport and that's actually which is really corny to say, brought us closer and made our friendship stronger. So I just wanted to finish off on that story to sort of share how sport can bring people together and how it can help build relationships and help strengthen relationships. And I hope through this podcast today, Chris, you and I have managed to strengthen our relationship and uh, that with our listeners as well. I'm a sopping myth after that. Aww. Gross. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely right. And on that note, thank you very much for joining me tonight, Chris. Pleasure. As always, time for bed. Absolutely time for bed. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I hope you have enjoyed us talk about various sports. I hope you enjoy watching the Winter Olympics, if that is your thing. If not, we will see you probably for some supercars action in March um, before we start talking about something else entirely. Um, On that note, I've been Michael Zalavari. Peace out. to be daddy chris god help us all <laughs> god help your child <laughs> i'm gonna tell you you said that god help you her <laughs> yeah i definitely won't tell you tell you said god help her <laughs> uh, she's, on the, she's on the couch it's fine i'm sorry shell